A quick disclaimer before we get into our discussion, the plants and compounds mentioned in this episode are illegal in many countries, and even possession can carry severe criminal penalties. This episode does not constitute medical advice nor legal advice and should not be construed as a recommendation to use psychedelics. There are serious psychological, legal, and physical risks involved, and these topics are used in this episode for educational purposes only. Hi, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Telescience, the podcast where reality matters. I'm a plant scientist, and I'm interested in all things nutrition, food, planet, and also consciousness. And I am a former communication grad and vertical farmer who's very interested in public education and nutrition. And today we have a very special guest, and I'm thrilled to have Dr. Dennis McKenna with us. As you know, uh, most people will know who Dennis is. Uh, So we are going to talk about the recent research and uh, current status of psychedelics and their potential uses in therapeutic uh, applications. So before we get started, I just wanted to briefly mention how I got interested in psychedelics. It was 2012, uh, 20 years ago, actually around March, and I found myself sort of, you know, in the crossroads both professionally and personally, uh, kind of starting new in both both areas. And luckily, I came across a book called The DMT, The Spirit Molecule, written by uh, Rick Strassman. I got so interested because it was about plants and what plants could do and uh, the drugs. And so I, uh, out of the blue, sent an email to Rick. And to my surprise, he replied. And it led me to go visit him. Uh, in New Mexico. And I went and had lunch with him and he was wonderful. And after he heard what my interests were, he put me in touch with Dr. Dennis McKenna. And I think it was 2013, Dennis, when uh, you came and visited your former alma mater as well to Stanford. We we met at Stanford for the very first time almost 20 years ago. Not quite. uh, Less than a decade ago. Oh, that's that's right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, right, but I, I was it that long ago? Right, right. No, was about it that long ago, Rajneesh, was it 2014? Uh, I think flies. it was, yes. I think it was like around 2013, 2014. So about, about that long ago, I think. But it's, be, it's been a wonderful knowing you and, and we've shared uh, our thoughts and uh, ideas about uh, the progress in the psychedelic arena. Uh, and I've been interested in this in several different ways. Um, in 2019, I uh, had the privilege to visit Brazil and um, try ayahuasca with Luna Eduardo, uh, which is which was wonderful experience. It was a life changing experience, hosted by him. And uh, since not since then, but even before then, I was interested in uh, the chemistry or the process and how um, psychedelics work. And uh, in during this time, I have come up with a theory which I call uh, the theory of spatial relativity, which I presented along with Dennis at the, con- the Science of Consciousness earlier uh, uh, this year. So that, that's been my journey, but uh, that's how I've gotten interested and uh, known Dennis. But just to mention a little bit about Dennis, Dennis and of course uh, his brother Terence, I think you know, going back to uh, 1967, the summer of love uh, in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, I think uh, one of the most famous parts uh, that uh, that I think uh, both Dennis and Terence wrote about was the experiment at La Chorera. And uh, I've read about, uh, I've read uh, what Dennis has written and Terence has written. And I think the more I read, it starts to make more sense to me. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, just allow Dennis now time to tell us about uh, himself, and then maybe we'll talk about the recent conference that Dennis organized, uh, ESPD 55. The first one took place in 1967, so 55 years later. Uh, the, uh, this one happened at uh, in UK just this year in May. So, uh, Dennis. <clears throat> well, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Rajneesh and uh, and Bridget for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be on with you, uh, Rajneesh, Rajneesh, because you're just a man that's just full of ideas. And some of them I can actually understand. Most of them are way <laughs> over my head, I mean, frankly. But, but you know, it's always stimulating. 
uh, to go on with you as we were recently at the Science of Consciousness Forum. I, I am. Uh, it's interesting that you that you said the experiment at La Chirera. It was interesting that you said about the experiment at La Chirera that it was making more and more sense to you. I wish I could say the same. You know, the further away from it I get, the less sense it makes to me, you know. But uh, anyway, we're not really going to talk about the experiment at La Chirera. That is, that is one thing I almost never talk about because I because it's so difficult to make any sense of. In 2021, we had the 50th anniversary of the experiment at La Chirera. So we did a whole thing on the McKenna Academy website, and if people really want to delve into that, they can go there and look at those talks. And yeah, the, the so only on. thing I will only thing I will say that made more makes more sense now. I think back then you would have no idea how uh, what the relationship biochemically or at molecular level would be with neurons, but you That's wrote that. Right. So I'm actually, I, I know you don't want to go into detail on what that experiment was, but is there a way you could just outline what, what it, the, the basics were? Because I'm not familiar with it at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> if I try to do that, we're going to go okay. down that rabbit hole. <laughs> let's just say, let's just say that in 1971, my brother and I, were obsessed with DMT. We had discovered DMT. We were obsessed with psychedelics in general, but we were particularly obsessed with DMT because uh, it would seem an order of magnitude stranger and more interesting than other psychedelics. And there weren't that many around. And the, you know, there was LSD and there was gotcha. mescaline sometimes. And, and there was DMT, but it was very rare, you know, but my brother was able to manifest it out of the matrix and we <laughs> got very interested in it. And we thought this is not, not only the most interesting drug we've ever experienced, not that we were such experienced druggies, but, but of the psychedelics, we thought this is by far the most interesting psychedelic. Gotcha. And so... But the problem was that we, that it's very short. You smoke DMT and it only lasts about 15 minutes. So we were oh, wow. somewhat frustrated by the fact that it was so short. By the time it actually, you know, you get into that place and we thought of it as a place, maybe another dimension. We were science fiction nuts. We weren't really, this wasn't a spiritual uh, quest for us. This was uh, this was almost a cosmic quest, and but we thought of that as a place, and and we were frustrated because on DMT you can only spend fifteen minutes or so there. By the time it begins to make sense, you know, or or you know, you're already coming out of it. So what led us to uh, go to South America in 1971 was we heard about a mysterious orally active form of DMT that was a, a hallucinogen, a psychedelic used by the Witoto people. And we heard about this in a journal and we thought we have to go down there because we thought if it was orally active, we could basically spend more time in the state and learn, learn more about it. So that's what led us down there, you know, and at the time, we didn't really understand. That's what effectively that's what ayahuasca is. Ayahuasca is a orally active form of DMT. You know the the beta carbolines in in the vine. That one of the components of ayahuasca, Banisteriopsis, contains these beta carboline alkaloids that are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So they will prevent the breakdown of DMT in the admixture plants, which are which it's from which it's also made. So, so then the DMT is orally active, and instead of 15, 20 minutes, you get seven hours. So, oh, wow, big difference. A big difference. Not at that yeah. level of intensity, but enough gotcha. that you have time to kind of really explore what that's about and, and bring back, you know, what you learn. 
uh, Interesting. The, 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 the short acting DMT is astonishing and overwhelming. And that's about all you can say about it. It's like, Oh my God, I just experienced the most incredible, you know, experience of my life. What happened? I can't remember, <laughs> you know, so, so ayahuasca is by far the more accessible, uh, uh, form of, of DMT, if you want to explore it, you know, but then that said, I would also say, and, you know, I'm not going to go down this pathway, I, but, you know, That's since we're on the, since we're on the topic, so we got to La Terrera, this place where we went to find this thing, what we found initially were psilocybin mushrooms that were all over the place. We had had no experience with them and we got into them uh, big time, you know, very recklessly probably in a way. And we realized very quickly that psilocybin in some way, psilocybin is the perfect orally acting form of DMT, you know, because psilocybin is converted to psilocin in the body and psilocin differs from DMT by just one substitution the hydroxy group on the indole ring is enough to make it orally active and psilocybin is you know it is i think you know rajneesh may agree i think in some way it is it is at high doses you can get to dmt like places with psilocin or psilocybin and it is an orally active form of DMT, really. I think of it that way. Uh, so I'm not going to say more about the experiment at lunch. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay. Um, how about we circle back to your, your, uh, you guys just came back, well, recently came back from that ESPD, conference. ESPD, the... ESPD 55. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can tell us a summary or you know, uh, what was the exciting outcome. Sure, I can tell you that. That's much easier. That does not require violation of any physical laws. Uh, yeah, so this conference, uh, ESPD 55, ESPD stands for the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And the history of this is that in 1967, the U.S. government sponsored, sponsored a conference by that name in uh, San Francisco, it was a closed conference, and the only thing the taxpayers ever got from that was this symposium volume that they published under that name, Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And all the leading investigators at that time who were interested in this topic, you know, and there weren't that many of them, most of them were there, uh, people like Richard Schultes from Harvard, Alexander Shulgin, who's uh, known in the psychedelic world as a, you know a brilliant chemist. He made more than uh, 300 different kinds of psychedelics during his career, all with government approval. And people like that, you know, old timers actually, Andy Weil, people like that who were young then and not so young now or passed on. But anyway, they had this conference and uh, published this book, which was available from U.S. government printing office. Somehow or other, I got my hands on that book at the age of 17, the year after it was published. And, and I, it was a revelation for me. I just read the whole thing from cover to cover, and it was fascinating uh, because I was interested you know in psychedelics and i thought you know this is a career path this is the path i'd like to go because it was very much nuts and bolts you know it talked about the plants the chemistry the pharmacology less about the ethnography and the anthropology and all that but enough you know to to make it interesting so so the government was supposed to have follow-up conferences to this uh, every 10 years or so. And the war on drugs came along and the government decided that they, not only were they not going to do follow-up conferences, but they were embarrassed to even be associated with this thing. So 
So, you know, it never happened. And uh, I always wanted to do, I, an aspiration was I wanted to do a follow-up conference because I, uh, I thought the topic was interesting, the field was interesting. And I wanted to do it for 50 years and it never felt, it, nothing ever fell into place to make that possible. But in 2017, uh, through several accidents, kind of lucky accidents, I found a place to do it in the UK, this place uh, at Tiringham Hall in, in you know this amazing country guest house in, uh, in uh, I forget the exact region at the moment, but north of London, anyway, a couple hours north of London. So we did ESPD 50 there and uh, 50th anniversary. And uh, that was an amazing conference as well. Uh, and we published a, a proceedings from it. We actually republished the 67 uh, proceedings because it was in the public domain. So we could do that. And it had long been out of print. The government printing office didn't sell it anymore. Uh, although I don't know why, it was probably one of their best selling publications. But Maybe that was the reason they stopped. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, so we reprinted that, and we printed the uh, the sixty, you know, the the twenty seventeen proceedings too as a box set, uh, batch box set, and that's been selling, and it continues to sell. So, in the spirit of doing these things regularly, in the meantime. In 2017, there was no McKenna Academy. It was just me and some collaborators who wanted to make this happen. So we did. We had some funding. We had a place, and we were passionate, you know. So, so in in 2022 was the 55th anniversary of the 67 conference, or the fifth anniversary of of the 2017 conference. So, in the spirit of doing these things regularly, we decided, excuse me, to do it again. And, uh, and we did, and it was a bigger deal this time. We had many more speakers. We had, I think, about 37 different presentations over four days and uh, covering a variety of topics. Uh, uh, some of them just related to, you know, topics in the ethnopharmacology, but the whole idea of the ethnopharmacologic search for psychoactive drugs was to not just talk about the same ones over and over again, talk about the obscure ones, you know. So we had some uh, presentations about, uh, uh, you know, for example, the use of psychedelics in Zoroastrianism. And we had a presentation on, the, on psychedelics in Chinese medicine and uh, one presentation on, on psychoactive sponges and, you know, so a variety of, of areas. And then this time we kind of broadened the scope in some ways. Uh, uh, so we weren't just talking about these plants and these molecules and so on. We had a couple of forums. We had uh, one forum on coca. Uh, which is hardly an obscure psychotropic plant. And then, but coca, you know, in its unpurified, coca is stigmatized because it's the co source of cocaine. Uh, but coca itself is a very beneficial medicine and used un, unconcentrated as, as, a, as a leaf or a powder. It's very good for people. And it's... Uh, uh, and it's really at the heart of Andean uh, culture and ethnomedicine and everything. So we had some people who are recognized for their expertise on coca, among them Andy Weil and Wade Davis and uh, Cody uh, Swift, who is the founder of the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund. So they did a special forum on coca, which was quite interesting and then we did a policy forum where interested in the 
sort of regulatory framework for psychoactive drugs, particularly psychedelics. So we had Dr. David Nutt from uh, King's College in the UK, who's an expert on the regulatory uh, environment for these things, but he's also a leading researcher on psilocybin. So he presented also on his work and uh, Carrie Turnbull from the uh, from the Hefter Institute, which I'm also affiliated with, made a presentation on different companies that are trying to patent uh, these ancient medicines, you know, particularly uh, Compass Pathways, which is sort of, you know, trying to find a way to patent uh, psilocybin. And, you know, the community is pushing back against that idea. So Kerry gave a very interesting talk on uh, some of the legal work that he effectively has subsidized to make sure they can't patent psilocybin and it remains free in the public domain. I, I, I found that talk very interesting. I think that was the one about the structure of the crystals. That's right. That's and, right. And how the crystals can, uh, you know, and the, these drugs have been around for many, many hundreds of years. Uh, so they're not uh, discovered. So uh, to, to figure out ways what can be patented and what cannot be patented is really important. Yeah, I think it's important to protect these these things. I mean, it's all very well to develop new derivatives and so on, but but these things that are really ancient medicines have been under the stewardship of indigenous peoples for thousands of years, and it's just not right for corporate predators to come along and patent them and then say, we own this, you know, and you have to pay a lot of money to get access to the therapy and so on. So, come, you know, so I think that was worthwhile to do that for. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I also another one, I, uh, going back to what you were mentioning, uh, there was one uh, on South Asian tree, I think, Catan, um, which mm -hmm. has alkaloids. But uh, it's not clear that the alkaloids are the active ingredients. Uh, we don't know yet, really, what. Mm -hmm. So th that was quite interesting to me as well. Yeah, I thought I thought that was the. I think that was the second presentation, and it was it was very good. I thought it was, and it was actually a. He was at the ESPD fifty conference, and uh, and his work has gone that much further since. And yeah, it was extremely good presentation and and a whole lot of new information was shared so uh yes and you know we had uh we had dr bruce damer who is somebody you might want to have on this show very close friend of mine a ask actually an astrobiologist who has very interesting ideas about the origin of life and uh, mm -hmm. has been published in Science and Nature, and you know is is definitely recognized. But he is a uh, he's an astrobiologist, but he's also a visionary scientist, and uh, he uses psychedelics. But he also uh, and uh, Rajneesh, this will interest you. He can spontaneously get into these visionary states you know, which he understands to be inducing DMT, you know, and he, he can actually get into a DMT-like state and get inspiration. And he, he gave a talk about the, uh, the application of psychedelics as scientific instruments, effectively uh -huh. as lenses through which you could look at the world, you could look at nature, and perceive processes and things going on that normally you just don't notice, you know, because the brain is conditioned to put things into the background. You know, if it's not about the bus that's about to hit you or the, or the saber tooth tiger that's attacking you, you know, you need your attention on that. Right. But that doesn't mean that stuff that's going on in the background right. is not important. And well, one this, thing psychedelics do, they bring the background forward. You know? Yeah, right. this is this is important. I think our our world is really defined by the perceptions, and our perceptions are limited, and that yeah. that goes mm -hmm. back to the apes. 
That's so I, right. think, I think I think Bridget had a question for you about that. <laughs> well, yeah, I I was really interested in your your stoned ape theory or hypothesis as well, and how how that kind of um, relates to what we were just talking about, also with the reality and perceptions and how that has we we've been able to evolve over time and why. Um, that hypothesis might actually be a thing. So I was just curious if you could dive into that sure, uh, sure. hypothesis a little too. Well, Bruce, uh, um, uh, Paul Stamets, who shares my interest in the Stone Day theory, and really we both uh, owe my brother sort of acknowledgement here because he's the one that came up with it. Uh, and Paul presented on the Stone Day theory at ESPD 55 a little bit. He told me he was going to talk about that. He did for about five minutes. Then he, <laughs> then he spun off into his own work, which was extremely interesting. You know, but, but his title, but the title of his talk was about uh, sort of confirming or yeah. But that was that was just a hook. I think. <laughs> that, that was that was just to get people interested. But yeah, his talk in general was quite interesting about this microdosing work that he's doing and its potential. You know, and he's he's publishing in very high quality journals, and he uh, and it's, it's potential possibly to treat cognitive uh, conditions, maybe not Alzheimer's, but you know, cognitive deficits that show up in old people like me, aging people. And uh, it can really help ameliorate that. So he was talking about well, that. I, and, I, and, I, and I heard that, watched that one as well, and especially the stack. And that kind of brings us back to the stone ape theory as well, because uh, the, the psilocybin and the uh, alliance, uh, you know, and, and also, uh, you know, his stack, uh, he had a niacin in there as well. So mm -hmm. uh, if, if he, uh, that seemed to be the most effective in his uh, microdosing studies. So now, how how do we relate that to the stone ape theory? Did they have access to all these together? I don't know if it's directly related. I think, I mean, my my version of the stone ape theory, which I think is the best, you know, because it's my version. Uh, but but basically, it's this: it's that uh, there's good evidence that well, you can't prove it which makes it nice because nobody can disprove it either, right? But but there's good evidence that in the, about, you know, we know from the fossil record that about 2 million years ago, between 2 million years ago and the present, the human brain has evolved, basically tripled in size. And that growth in size is also reflected by uh, an increasing complexity in the in the in the structure of the brain. Much of this uh, has to do with the structures that uh, that deal with language, both the generation and the comprehension of language. There's large amounts of neural uh, real estate, if you will, devoted to language and. Uh, uh, and three million years, two million years for uh, for this to take place seems like a long time, but in evolutionary terms, it's actually a very short time. So what stimulated this essentially explosive expansion of the brain, of the human brain, in these hominid populations evolving in Africa around that time, especially in North Africa? Well... And so the, 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 the theory is you know, that, uh, or, you know, the stone ape theory is that these mushrooms were present in the environment. And we do know from paleoclimatology and other data and fossil evidence that the area of, in Northern Africa at the time was, was much wetter. There were periods of wet and dry cycles over hundreds of thousands of years but for a lot of that time there was you know seasonal rainfall sometimes you know uh, a lot of rainfall there were cattle in the area and the mushroom grows on the dung of cattle so there were these ancestral cattle there 
called aurochs that, again, fossils of those have been found. Fossils of those are found in the same areas that the fossil hominids are found. So you had, you know, you had the, the cattle, you had the people, you had warm tropics, you had a warm tropical savanna. Mushrooms had to be there. They just had to be there because if you know, if you look at any similar environment today, if you go to the tropics, any pasture with cattle on it, particularly in well, really anywhere in the tropics, Africa, India, uh, you know, South America, these mushrooms will be present. So it's reasonable to think that that environment existed and the mushrooms. The Psilocybe cubensis are the the pan tropical mushrooms. These are not hard to spot. I mean, these get rather large, and they're they're easy to spot. They're either golden, you know, they're golden color. You can't overlook them. And if you're a hungry hominid, obviously you're going to eat these things, and you're going to have the effects. And uh, and people say, well, yeah, so they have the effect. So, so what? Well, what we knew, what we know now that we did not know when Terence came up with the study was a couple of things uh, that have come to light since. One of them is neuroplasticity and the fact that these psilocybin induces uh, both a reorganization of the the connectome of the connect of the synaptic uh, networks and it also proliferates neurons it causes neurogenesis so and this is being studied right now this is related mm -hmm. to the uh, you know the therapeutic uh, efficacy of mushrooms and one of the reasons why, uh, they're so promising for, for these various things because they can actually reorganize the way that the, uh, that the brain architecture is, is, is connected, essentially. It's, you know, it actually stimulates that. But then the other aspect of this is the epigenetic aspect. It's a method, it's a, it's a means by which these changes can be inherited over generations that are not necessarily inherited in the usual way. They're inherited through an epigenetic pathway having to do with modifications of DNA post-transcription. And we know that many factors can influence epigenetic adaptations, including substances, right? And, and psilocybin is one of these substances so that's a mechanism so that in my mind you can't prove this but epigenetics plus this neuroplasticity which we know they do sort of in my mind moves the needle to you know from okay an interesting plausible theory to an interesting, more than likely theory, <laughs> knowing I, what we know about the environment. Logic, at that I mean, time. Logically, it, it connects the dots uh, along the way. And exactly. I just wanted to mention Louis Schwartberg's uh, a movie, a Fantastic Fungi, that has wonderful animation right. <laughs> showing yeah. this whole concept. Yeah, Fa Fantastic Fungi is a great movie and it does it does talk about this one of the factors that i think is important here is something associated with psychedelics and particularly with mushrooms is uh synesthesia synesthesia is the crossover of different sensory modalities so you know right. you can see sounds you know and uh you can, you know, you can actually visualize sounds. Well, if you think about language, this is what language is. Language is a process of synesthesia, you know, where we can link an internal uh, image to some meaningful sound or mm. or something external, you know. And and, and this is, uh, and I think that that uh, psilocybin essentially taught us how to do this they they were they were stimulants in the origins of language because we live inside a 
uh, what I what the neuroscientists call a, a default mode network. What I call I like to call it the reality hallucination. <laughs> nice. Our brains construct a reality based that is kind of a model of the world. It's not reality itself, but it's a it's it's a model of the world. And a lot of what the brain does is uh, selectively filter sensory inputs. Everything that mm -hmm. comes in isn't, doesn't necessarily get through. You know, the brain selectively takes what it what comes in from the outside and uh, you know associates that with memories and and inner uh, essentially images and and symbols and create creates this this model of reality and that's the reality hallucination that's the reality that we live in and it all runs on uh, on language and and i think that uh, i think that psilocybin was a essentially a cognitive learning tool for helping us uh, come up with language and if you got language if you can represent if you can link an image to a meaning that's the instance of language and it then is, huh? you know you can go yeah. on from there and you know uh, and but that but language is what everything else depends on you know culture yeah, and, it's, and it is important because once language comes around then the apes that had already tried it they could tell other apes hey try this one <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah what once you have language you can you can uh yeah, you can transmit information across mm -hmm. time and space, you know, geographically yeah. and also through oral traditions and then written language, which is just another step in the process, you know. Right. I, I can look at these meaningless squiggles on a page, you know, and that's all they are is meaningless squiggles, except that I have the internal machine machinery to look at writing on a page and it makes sense it effectively narrates itself so when, right. i don't know how it is for you but when i read a page effectively a voice in my head yeah. is reading the page yeah. right and so yeah there is that uh that aural element to it so that's the basis of the stone date theory and i think it's you know, I mean, it's it's interesting to to think about at least. Uh, and what else? You know, what else could contribute to this explosive uh, growth in in the human brain? So much of which has to do with language. You know, the different right. language areas. I mean, people have said, well, you know, it, I mean, it, it's all related to you know being able to. Uh, throw spears and this sort of thing that's important but i don't think that alone is gonna no. is gonna right. explain it so anyway yeah no that, that, that that's a that's a paradigm shift in our abilities and that has to have some boost and so it it, it makes sense and also what you bring up with that is reality itself uh, and perhaps the reality that we see is is filtered as we were talking and the the real reality is much broader and so uh, these these um, uh, uh, psychedelics or anthogens they are somehow opening our doorway to this broader reality and opening our our abilities or potential to yeah. evolve in in certain directions yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean that 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 is that is what they do, and and I think that's the basis of a lot of their therapeutic, uh, you know, usefulness too. So this this default mode network that we inhabit or this reality hallucination uh, doesn't always work too well. You know, you can get into feedback loops that are not positive. You know, and uh, that are not not positive in the sense that they're not beneficial, like obsessions and compulsions. And right. this leads to anxieties and, and trauma and all of these things. What the psychedelics can do, they come along, they can just demolish that, that framework temporarily. 
and let you step outside of it. So you look at your situation outside and maybe maybe you can, you know, from outside that framework, you can look at whatever your issue is, depression, addiction, trauma, and so on. And effectively, by understanding it, by looking at it from a fresh perspective, you can defuse it, essentially. It does not have a, it doesn't dominate. And the default mode network is very resilient. The equilibrium will reestablish itself. You know, it's all going to fall back together, but it's going right. to work better that this time. It literally is like booting your computer, rebooting your lubricator. Computer. Yeah, lubricator. So, so, um, yeah. It actually, I was going to say, because I don't, I don't have any personal experiences with psychedelics, but how you described it there kind of reminds me of meditation, where. Um, you're able to separate, say, yourself from that voice in your head mm -hmm. and kind of look at things a little bit differently or um, less judgmentally around, you know, whatever problems are going on in your life and whatever obsessions or things that are getting you down, kind of separating yourself and that situation that's going around you. Um, yeah. well, but that, maybe to a greater extent, that's exactly right? It. I mean, meditation can do that as well, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, it can. Meditation is often, you know, I mean, I guess what sets the psychedelics apart in some ways is that they are, they are uh, you know, meditation can nudge you in that direction. Psychedelics will blast you in that direction. <laughs> and sometimes that's needed, you know, like... Yeah like uh, the term catharsis. I think these things in some ways can be thought about, thought of as cathartogens, you know, which is kind of a shock to the system that can reset a bunch of, and reset things and lead to a sense of renewal, you know. I mean, meditation is certainly, certainly useful. And uh, it takes I, a lot of effort, though, too. So I think that's probably the appeal of having something that um, isn't isn't as like something that you have to practice. It's something that you can yeah, enjoy every, easier, that, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Most yeah. most people are not up for it. Really, both of them, you know, they go together. And mm. they've actually done uh, some clinical studies with psilocybin in uh, experienced meditators like Zen oh, monks wow. and this sort of thing, and uh, they uh, they like it, you know, <laughs> and and they they feel that it's not exactly like meditation, but it's a, it's mm -hmm. a it's a state that they recognize that it has value. It's different, but it. But it is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they can recognize its value. So, yeah, some of these studies are pretty interesting in that way. And I think what what's also, like, important to mention is just how, I, at least I see our, our generations are, are going with a lot more depression and anxiety and a lot of trouble, like, issues in those senses, and on the same side there's a lot of pharmaceuticals there to like you yeah. know take the pills and you're fine as long as you're taking the pills but personally i know so many people my age or around my age that either have had horrible experiences using things like antidepressants or just have you know severe cases of depression and anxiety and you know fall to other things like addiction and um it, it's not turning out so well with or without those antidepressants um so i think the research is really needed there for other things that are possibly more natural medicines to help and i wanted to hear you know your opinion on if this is something that could you know be be a bigger part of helping that like epidemic of depression. Oh yeah, yes, yes yeah. definitely. Because the usual uh, palate, the usual psychopharmaceutical uh, medications do not, they don't work that way. I mean, they're band-aids essentially. And right. a, a lot of times the effects are barely distinguishable from placebo. 
you right. know, and uh, they don't really get let you resolve the problem. You know, you, you have to deal with it. You have to keep taking them and uh, and they don't really let you get to the root of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes this case of you pretty much have to take them the rest of your life or for long periods right. and you never really get to the bottom of why you're depressed why you mm-hmm. feel this way you know and the psychedelics can you know after a few sessions sometimes just one after very few sessions they give you insights into your situation and they can help you sort of re-understand it and thereby overcome it, you know, and, and you yeah. probably heard people say, you know, uh, like four ayahuasca sessions was like 10 years of psychotherapy, you know, <laughs> and it really is. Which, which is funny. I, I, from the fantastic, uh, fun, fungi movie, uh, one of the things they mentioned towards the end was that it's not a very good business model <laughs> to do, it's not do a it good because it's only, yeah, you know, a... <laughs> two or yeah, three. I think that was Michael Pollan who was Oh, okay, okay, yeah, they That's said that. Right. It's yeah. not a good business model because you're not going to be selling it for a long time. It's a you know, couple of sessions big, or something. Big that Pharma would, oh. wants drugs that you take right. four times a day for the rest of your life, you know. Right. I mean, that's, it's awful. That's, but it it it's not quite that bad. I mean, the business model for psychedelics is not the substances because you do take them a few times, and if they work, and that really depends a lot on the the right set and setting and what what you do with this uh, with this special place and time that they render accessible to you. The whole set and setting dynamic you know but properly applied you shouldn't have to take them all the time some of us like me i guess i'm thick skulled i keep taking them but but you know less and less as i get older but uh it it, but it's not the substances it's the services that you gotcha the the therapy that goes with it the preparation then the actual sessions and then integration you know, integration is very mm-hmm. important. You know, uh, people sometimes say that when they come to my ayahuasca retreats, you know, which I used to do, they say, you know, you know, the real work didn't begin until I got on the plane to go home. You know, you wow. come away with so much to think about and so much to integrate. So right. that kind of support is where the business model comes and, in, and that, that's know. that's what i think uh, in the last uh, section of this podcast I, well i thought what we can focus on is what uh, paul stamets is also uh, was also talking about is the difference yes. between uh, reducing the chemical the active ingredient like psilocybin itself or dmt itself versus the whole whole um, uh, mushroom or or the ayahuasca and I know Paul is uh, already working uh, with re- re- doing research and compa- comparing psilocybin versus the whole mushrooms. Uh, but I think going to these these uh, ceremonies, um, I I've, I hope that we don't lose that context of where the active ingredient is, and somehow that is maintained in therapeutic applications. Uh, but that's a very tough challenge because. Uh, it's uh, pharmaceutically, it's a lot easier to reduce it, extract it, patent it, mm-hmm. patent it, or or, or uh, even apply it in known concentrations. Uh, that's right. What yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, these clinical uh, studies, they like pure compounds, you know, that you can. But I don't think they necessarily have to be used that way, and that that isn't even the the preferable way. I think we're in a place where, you know, we really need to pay attention to the way that indigenous people have always used these things. You know, they have learned a few things about how to use them, you know, in the last 10,000 years that they've been at it, you know, and the ceremonial context is just another way to structure the set and setting. It's very important that you have an appropriate set and setting. You know, and that's a complex set of variables. But 
primarily, I mean, the setting is kind of obvious. You want to do it in a place where, you know, you're comfortable, where you know that you're safe, where you know that you don't have to really worry about real world issues. There may be somebody there who can make sure that, you know, all those things are taken care of and they're looking after you basically, which I mean, maybe not, they're just present. Uh, and that's important, especially if you haven't had experience with these things. But then the set, the set is the complex, the complex variable because the set is you. The set is everything you bring to it. Uh, your memories, your experience, your expectations, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the set is the subject, your mindset, essentially. And that's a combination of your whole life experience. And, uh, and, and so, you know, these things are the essential variables. And then, of course, whatever the medicine is and whatever the dose is, those are also important variables. But mm -hmm. in order, you know, it, it does not work. It, it, and there's no reason why you have to go to a hospital and take this in a you know, in a clinical hospital room, right. that's probably the least ideal setting. And I mean, other than, you know, on the freeway or something, you know, but, but uh, you should have a compatible setting, a natural yeah. setting. And uh, uh, that's good advice for any type of drug. Yeah. <laughs> well, especially, or, especially or uh, yeah. you know, Paul Stamets has been testing microdosing, especially also right. with his app. And, uh, uh, you know, he mentions that in his talk as well, that to to go to a hospital for microdosing doesn't make any sense. Uh, no. Right. <laughs> right. So. No, it, it certainly it certainly doesn't. I mean, this is something that you would take like a supplement, you know, and and effectively there's there's no psychoactivity associated with it. But it can kind of I mean, the best way to do it is to follow up a macro experience with mushrooms and then and then supplement with with micro doses uh you know to to help maintain that right. that cognitive effect you you just can kind of grouped it with a supplement right but it's still you'd still be tripping a bit if you're using micro dosing right no, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't really okay. feel that there's really no psychoactivity associated oh, okay. with it, as such. I mean, just a feeling of mm -hmm. kind of being together. I guess you yeah. say. You know, uh, attention Connected. is yeah. focused. Uh, you feel calm. You don't feel anxious. You feel gotcha. you feel normal. It it kind of optimizes the normal. You know, I think that's that's, that's one way to put it. You know, okay. I mean, and it's if, a big if difference. If we're feeling normal, we're not anxious. We're not, you know, with all these right. things that we are. You know, that there's so much of. But if if you feel normal, you just feel normal. Good. Feel good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think Paul mentioned the the difference between the you know, regular dose is usually thirty milligrams of psilocybin that the test. Uh, in clinics, uh, but microdosing is down to one to three milligrams, so it's it's a lot less. Right. If I right. Yeah. Correctly. Yeah, and and I, I don't think you have much of an acute effect, but yeah. you will notice over time right. there is an effect. You know, and mm -hmm. all that said, I have to you know I have to say uh, there are there is a need for better studies. It's very yes. hard to to study this in a placebo double blind type uh, structure, it's, it's right. not appropriate, but it would be good to have better uh, measured studies to show that there really is an effect. Right. Because here's the thing, in medicine, placebo effect is also a real thing, right. you know, and you can't necessarily separate them, but it's kind of like placebo effect, microdosing effect, you know, if, if you feel the benefit, does it really matter? Right. You know, uh, so there is that aspect of it too. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. Well, it's you great. Know, indeed, we probably haven't covered half of what we wanted to. But <laughs> we'll just have to do another one. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> well, I feel like I've learned a lot um, 
from my minimal knowledge beforehand. Um, so, so thank you for, for expanding my, my view on this oh, topic as well. Happy to talk to you. Always, always happy to talk to Rajneesh. And, and uh, have you interviewed him about his work on plants? I mean, we met over the, you know, what brought us together was kind of this mutual interest in what do these neural transmitter-like compounds do for plants? Well, and, and actually, uh, you told me your initial research was on chikimic acid pathway, uh, which that, is what I was interested in. Uh, your your research, Bridget? no, your, your your research. I think you you're working with, yeah. uh, right? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, with some aspects of chikimic acid pathway of the, the uh, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine biosynthesis. Uh, oh well, yes, yes, I was. I was in a certain way. Yeah, when I when I started my my graduate work at, at uh, UBC, I initially worked on psilocybin. I was interested in the genetic regulation of psilocybin biosynthesis. That's that's what I was focused on. So in that sense, yeah, I was interested in it. What it really was, it was just excuse. To be able to grow lots of mushrooms in the growth <laughs> chamber, you know, at the university, which I did, and all under uh, federal government license. Although, you know, I can share with you some graduate student parties that year were pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, we were much more cavalier about it. But but then I gave that up and I, I shifted my, uh, my studies to ayahuasca. That's, yeah, that's but, you know, what I ended up we, working on. I remember the when we met, whether it was 2013 or 2014 at Stanford, I think what we both enjoyed uh, realizing was that uh, mm-hmm. most of the psychedelics or ethnogens that we have, we were we've been talking about, they're derived from these three uh, aromatic amino acids, one or actually two, mainly yes. tryptophan and phenylalanine. So, so this pathway has some really important track. Um, which is what I've been trying to follow biochemically, uh, right? To understand it, yeah. Right. Very interesting. Very important pathways, both in plants and and animals. And uh, uh, it, it, you know, uh, serotonin, for example, is phylogenetically the oldest neurotransmitter. I mean, and by old, I mean really old. There is there is evidence of you know, fungal-like organisms that had these kind of things like 3.3, 3.8 billion years ago. You know, these were not mushrooms. This was much before mushrooms. But tryptophan was out there and uh, one of the most ancient amino acids for whatever that's worth. I don't know. <laughs> so we can we can revisit this. Yes, we can revisit sometime. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. absolutely. This was yeah. absolutely amazing and uh, really enjoyed having you uh, on the podcast. Yeah, well, it, thank it you, was, Dennis. It was a pleasure and uh, it didn't malfunction, so I'm real happy <laughs> about that. So so for you guys listening to the Terra Science Podcast, thank you guys so much for your support. Please give us a like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any more of our future episodes. And thanks again to Dennis for being a wonderful guest. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes. We'll see you in the next one. Uh, Thank you. Thanks to do it. Okay. <laughs>